If you don't like that, then you don't like Big Ten football. And Robert, I like Big Ten football. I like Big Ten football. We, we both like Big Ten football. He's Robert Rosenthal from IlliniBoard.com. Joining us in studio once again for the Sunday No Huddle. And Robert, there's so many which ways we can go with this. Illinois winning 9-6 to six over Iowa. Let's start with the news of the day. Illinois back in the top 25, breaking an 11-year drought. Your reaction to that? I think you can see my reaction exactly. to that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's amazing. I'm, I, I was just running some stats of what it's been like since then. I mean, you know, they started – that time that they were ranked was the 6-0 and start in, in 2011. They finished 0-6. That's what got Ron Zook fired. Um, you know, that was – you know, nobody looks back on the 2011 season with warm fuzzies. It was this, like, how do you lose those six games in a row and all that kind of thing. So, in, in, in that sense – it's kind of strange that that's the season we're looking back on, but it is. And I looked up after that 2-0 and start in the Big Ten, Illinois only had 16 Big Ten wins from then, halfway through the 2011 season, until when Lovey was fired. 16 Big Ten wins over almost 10 full seasons. And then in starting in 2021 and now 2022, Brett Bielema has had 11 Big Ten games, and he's won six of them. I mean, 16 over almost 10 years and then six – in a year and a half, it's just it's an, it's an incredible turnaround. All right, well, let's start breaking down the game. And uh, I, I mentioned the punt aspect of the game and uh, Big Ten football. 14 punts in, in this one. Uh, nine to six score, no touchdowns, mm -hmm. five field goals. Mm -hmm. uh, let's start first with, uh, a, you know, the elephant in the room, Tommy DeVito, having to leave the game at the very end of the first quarter. Uh, did not come back after that. They said it was an ankle injury. How did you see Illinois change their offense with Art Sikowski under center? And are you concerned about what that could be if DeVito has to miss significant time? Well, it felt like the first 15 passes were all the same route in the flat that, you know, can't be picked off. Throw it to somebody out on the wing and see if they can make something happen. So they didn't ask him to do too much at first. I think the most surprising thing for Sikowski was when he – you know, those two out-of-nowhere throws, one to Brian Hightower, yeah. one, to, one to Jonah Morris, that, you know, it's almost as if Iowa's defense was lulled to sleep of, like, they're not going to throw over the top, they're not going to throw over the top, and all of a sudden, you know, two big plays, uh, and, and Illinois is in the red zone. So uh, that was surprising. You know, anytime a, a, a guy comes into a game when the game plan has been set for the other quarterback, it's a difficult thing. You know, say Tommy DeVito isn't able to go against Minnesota, that means Art Sikowski will get all the reps. He'll be in on the game planning. They will set up the game plan for what he does well, that kind of thing. You know, it's a better better chance for success when you've had the full week to prepare. Um, but, you know, credit to him. Obviously, the fans are, are kind of stuck on one play of the interception at the one. You know, that's a really, really tough look when we're in your game like this. I think the thought there was if we get a touchdown here, there's no way – you know, Iowa's never getting to the end zone, and they would need three field goals to beat seven. So uh, you put up seven here, and, and the game's over. But, um, you know, for, for what he had to do, uh, Art was enough and got him back into the end of field goal range, and they hit the field goal and won the game. And how about the performance from Fabrizio Pinton, the true redshirt freshman coming from Air Force, first year on the team. The plan going into the game, what Brett Vilma said, was Caleb Griffin, who's Working with a nagging injury right now to do anything 25 yards and in, Pinton would then do anything longer than that. He's warming up, says he can't go, so it's all on Pinton at that point, and he scores all nine points for the Atlanta. It's all they needed, and, you know, a really gutsy, ice-in-your-veins performance for the guy that probably didn't expect to have any games like this this year. Yes, and, it, it, you know, it's, it's hard to explain to people what it's like for that, you know, like, the third kicker on the roster kind of thing. You know, they inherited Caleb Griffin, but they also brought in Will McManus this year, and the expectation was that be that McManus would be the backup. So he transfers in as a walk-on from Air Force. You know, you're, you're so far from the field when you're the third kicker. You know, it's just <laughs> not close. So for him to not only be in this game, hit all three field goals, but hit the pressure pack field goal. How many of us have stood on the 18th tee thinking, you know, I can break 40 on this nine here if I just – I just need to bogey this hole. That tee shot is going in the lake. It just always is. So for him to have three minutes left, pressure of this game, team is going to be ranked if you make this kick, kid, and making it, it's, it's so, so impressive. Yeah, all right, let's talk about the defense as well. As always, the most impressive group on, on the team. 
I, I don't know where to go. We'll start with the front four, I think. Johnny Newton <clears throat> and Keith Randolph once again having an incredible performance. Seth Coleman having, I think, his best game as well. It it's, doesn't happen that your defensive tackle is leading the team in tackles, but that's what Johnny Newton is doing right now. I think at this point you have to say, I mean, just to be bold, he's the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year. You're halfway through the season, he has to be. Uh, he, he's the single most important to player to any Big Ten team at this moment. And I, I just can't see any way that he would not be. Now, obviously, those, those awards can get political and, okay, let's make the best Ohio State linebacker the Big sure. Ten Defensive Player of the Year, whatever. You know, that, that happens. I get that. But I, I don't think there's a better – Defensive player in the Big Ten right now impacting his team. It's it's on the level of, going back to 2011, Whitney Merciless in 2011. A um, little bit different role. He's a defensive end. He's, uh, you know, in his first team All-American, all you know, his his up there. And, you know, he didn't win Big Ten Player of the Year. But, you know, all of his acc accolades, they came from numbers and that type of thing. What Newton is putting together is this solid – disrupting every play even this dime package they have where they you know they bring in Matt Bailey as an extra safety they bring in Kaneno to Luga to rush Newton moves over to nose guard and rushes the quarterback from the center and he's getting pressure I mean he, they just move him around he'll have be double teamed by a center and a guard and he's still getting pressure uh, it's just so impressive what he's been able to do in all their different looks. He's such an impact player. This, the way that they're able to get pressure, this team has been so impressive to me this year. If we go back now, if we're going through the defense uh, to linebackers, I think they probably had their best game of the season uh, against Iowa, specifically Tariq Barnes, who added the sack, was really just all over the place, was really timing the Iowa offense well, who in their own right, not great. Mm -hmm. I think we saw that, but still goes to show that Illinois is shutting down a Big Ten offense like that didn't allow him into the end zone. Four home games now, no one's gotten to the end zone. And it just goes to show where you can have guys like Tariq Barnes have their best, or best game of the year. Just guys pop off like that. And that's what a good defense does all year round. And on top of that, you know, Taz Nicholson is out and yep. Terrell Jennings comes in. And let's not forget that Ezekiel Holmes was the starter. He goes out, a true freshman, Gabe Ackes, is suddenly, you know, putting up probably, you know, freshman All-American team kind of numbers and stats and everything. So, you know, for them to just keep, you know, they lose this guy or this guy's out for a bit or this guy needs a breather and, you know, Matt Bailey already has two interceptions yeah. as a freshman, should have three, drop the one in the Wyoming game, you know. It's just kind of crazy how they can insert some of these pieces and continue to, you know, be one of the top five defenses in the country. Yeah, all right. Well, let's look at the uh, – the, the top-down view to this now. Robert, I know you've been an Illini fan for a while. I, I'm sure you were following it in, in 1989. You can I was. correct me if, I, I'm, I'm, if yes. I'm wrong. Uh, this is the first year since then that Illinois has beaten Wisconsin and Iowa in the same season since 1989. Does, it, does that even seem right when you think back? Oh, it does. I mean, <laughs> from, from the fan side, I mean, I was at the, I, you know, the 2008 Iowa game sticks out in my mind because, you know, Illinois needed a 46 yard field goal for Matt Eller to win that game. You know, it was kind of similar. I think it was, an, it was either a late afternoon or a night game. I remember the lights were on when he, uh, <coughs> when he made that kick. And, you know, it, you, you could sense that it was a moment because Iowa is this team, right? I mean, let's go back through the list. 63 nothing. Every Illinois fan remembers that. The Nick Bell game in 1990 where Illinois was number five in the country. Brett Bielman was on that Iowa team. Uh, they came into Memorial Stadium in 1990 as the number 11 team and, you know, basically took the Rose Bowl away from Illinois with their tailback having a, an amazing game. So there's just been so many moments of, you know, close moments even on the road at Iowa. The 20, what was it, 2015, Illinois was driving for the winning score down something like 26-20. And Keyshawn Vaughn fumbled, uh, and, and Iowa, you know, kicked the clinching field goal, and that was that. But Illinois had every side, and so I'm like, hey, we're going to end this streak against Iowa right here. This is the moment it's going to end. And it just hasn't happened and hasn't happened. Even in 2007, Illinois has Iowa beat on the road, and they get an 83-yard touchdown called back for, uh, you know, illegal formation. So there's just been so many heartbreaks against Iowa uh, that it certainly does. I mean, and <laughs> – I could do the same list for Wisconsin yeah. if I wanted to. So, you know, for, to beat them, not only beat them in the same season, beat them back-to-back -back 
you know, to have this one knocked out and that one knocked out in two weeks and eight days time. It's just, it's crazy from the fan point. And it has to mean so much to Brett Bielema. And he won't let you believe that, but we talked after Wisconsin that you can definitely tell that it meant something. This one could have meant more because it's where he went to school. It's where he played for, it's where he started his coaching career. And to get both of them in the same season has to be one of the better, I, I feel like, feelings Brett Bielema has had as, mm -hmm. as a coach. Yeah, it's crazy that he was on this Iowa staff. Yeah. You know, and then he, you know, he went around and then he ended up at Wisconsin and then he was, you know, he, you know, he's had his time at Iowa, K-State, Wisconsin, head coach of Wisconsin, Arkansas, Patriots, Giants, now back to Illinois, his home state. And the coach he's facing the other sideline is the guy he was coaching for when he started. Yeah. You know, that's just crazy. He's had this journey of all these cities, uh, and the Iowa staff has been the same for this time. So for him to beat them, to beat them at their own game, mm -hmm. to play that, you know, as we talked about last week, using the Bill Connolly term, like tilt the field and wait. You know, you just <laughs> you make it very, very, very hard for them to move the ball. You make it very, very hard. You make it a sluggish drag it out game and you win that kind of rock fight um it's just really impressive to beat iowa at what they do best you can tell he was a little bit sentimental after the game when he was saying that he told josh you're getting the best version of me and i, I feel like he he really truly means that when you when you think about how people talk about how he inherited the team at wisconsin and he tries to go build something in arkansas and it doesn't go right he feels like he's really building something in illinois and now has the results to prove that yes and I mean let's not let's not forget that the three coaches he most learned from um, are Hayden Fry at Iowa who he played for and then coached for or, or Bill Snyder at K-State and Barry Alvarez at Wisconsin and all three of those coaches have this kind of legacy right you know Wisconsin was nothing from 1960 to 1990 in football they were they were bottom of the barrel they are what Illinois has been the last 25 years Barry Alvarez turned that around, and Wisconsin has the program they have now. K State, we don't have to talk about how bad they were. They were good for either two and nine or one and eleven every single year. Bill Snyder gets there, and the, his legacy is he resurrected K State football. Brett Bielma has that opportunity here. I mean, Hayden Fry did it at Iowa. They were bad for a long time, and then he resurrected them in the late seventies, I think nineteen eighty, whenever he got there. So that's the opportunity for Brett Bielma here is to say, I can build the legacy in the state I was born in, in Illini Hospital, as he likes to say. You know, he, can, he could be that coach at Illinois who says, look, bad for years and five winning seasons in the last 27 years and this and that. But, you know, in 20 years, they talk about there's Bill Snyder, what he did to K-State. There's Barry Alvarez, what he did to Wisconsin. There's Hayden Fry, what he did for Iowa. And there could be Brett Bielma and what he did for Illinois. And there's still so much more to go into building that legacy in its entirety. You know, we're just in year two, but showing that you can do it with another staff, mostly other staff's players, and being able to coach them up, I, I think says a lot. So five and one, Illinois right now coming out of the Iowa game, two and one in the Big Ten, leading the Big Ten West. Robert, you, when you look into your fandom, how do you even – think of that was that even on your radar of a possibility going into I, the year i predicted four and eight this season mm -hmm. you know with all the losses on the defense i said look it just takes a while there, you know a lot of players left Illinois is 120th in the country in returning production it's a new team you got new guys on the defense it just will take a while to rebuild for that team that i'm talking about in that way for the roster cliff i was talking about for years of like look once these 2017 recruits are gone that they've been relying on for four years, it's going to be some changes and there's going to be some this. For them to take that team and now be ranked blows my mind. I've never, as a fan, I've never experienced that in 35, 40 years of following this team. So um, it's just crazy. It's, it's hard to wrap your brain around being 5-1, and one, having back-to-back -back wins at Wisconsin and home over Iowa. Uh, and then to be looking at this, looking at the schedule, and Michigan State has fallen well off, and you know you have both Minnesota and Purdue have to come to Champaign, and Northwestern looks to be horrific, and you know you look at the schedule and you start thinking about what's possible. It's crazy that that's happening with this team. Yeah, I, I think I saw statistically eight and four is the most likely record yes. for the Illini right now. Which uh, I mean, just Andy, <laughs> take that. Just oh just yeah, put that 
Tell that to anyone in August. <laughs> Go up to them and say, yeah, Illinois is pretty sure, certainly eight and four team, right? Yeah. No one would have believed you. You could have gone to Vegas and bought a condo off the money you could have won just saying, oh, yeah, Illinois, yeah, eight win team, yeah. And they could win nine or ten. It's, exactly. It's, it's insane. Yeah, it, that leads us to this next week's game against Minnesota, how big that is for the division title race. Minnesota just one and one. They're coming off a of bye week, so they're not part of that three-way tie for first place in the Big Ten West right now. But we talked, I feel like, the last few weeks that we believe that Minnesota is probably the top dog in the West right now. Illinois is certainly making a case for it as well. But how big is this game for how the season title race getting to Indy is uh, just this weekend? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say because of what Minnesota did at home against Purdue. Now, they were missing Ibrahim, and, and he's, he's their whole offense. It would be like Illinois missing Chase Brown. Um, so it's, it's hard to say how much that was a factor in that game. But Minnesota losing at home 20 to 10 or whatever does tell you that, hey, you know, Purdue is probably a factor here. So in my mind, especially with Purdue going on the road and winning a tough game at Maryland, those are the three teams we've got to talk about. Those are the three teams. And so those two games are kind of equal in my mind as being Minnesota and Purdue, both coming to Illinois, will probably decide the Big Ten West. And as I'm saying those <laughs> words, my brain is malfunctioning as to, wait, did you just say if Minnesota and Purdue coming to Illinois will determine the Big Ten West? Are you sure you want to go with that? I mean, that's, what, that's the crazy territory we're in now. But we have to talk about that. You know, Wisconsin – you know, they, I, I don't know if they could, they, maybe they've resurrected their season or maybe maybe Northwestern is just really, really bad. I, I don't know. Um, but it just seems the way it's setting up right now, especially with the way the Illinois defense is playing, uh, that those two games in Champaign will, will determine who goes to Indy. And it's funny that, you know, Nebraska talking about now, they're 2-1 and one now. Mm -hmm. Like, they were from two weeks ago saying the season's lost, cancel the football program too. Yep. Maybe we can win the West. I don't know if that's true. Right. They've only beaten Indiana and uh, Rutgers so far. So I'd have to see them do it against someone else before I'm like, oh, maybe Nebraska's better mm -hmm. without the previous yes. coaching staff. Yeah, let's remember what Nebraska did against Oklahoma, who yes. just lost to Texas 49 nothing. Exactly. So can't always do that in football. But you're right, yes, yeah. there is. But go ahead. And, and there, I believe, <coughs> is some – some rush rushedness to to this season for this program where divisions could be going away in the Big Ten. Yes. And, and when that happens, it's going to be a lot harder for Big Ten West teams to even conceivably make it to the Big Ten title. Do you do you think that is that can not concern in the back of their mind, but that gives this season a, a different meaning almost that that could be one of the last chance real chances for a bit for a bit. Yes, I think I think you're right. I, I think it's a great point. There's there's definitely urgency on that end because it feels like in the future, if the Big Ten title game is one versus two, well, sure, Illinois might win the Big Ten West, but you know, you know, just even think of this season if there weren't divisions, could Illinois be the number two? But you know, they'd have to fight with then Penn State, Ohio State, and Michigan as the three teams. You know, they would have to be number two or number one in that list. So it's going to get a lot harder. But, yeah, so many of those things could be accomplished. Look, game day hasn't been in Champaign ever. You know, it, it just went to Kansas for the first time ever. Uh, I had said on here that if, if Minnesota was undefeated and maybe up to number 12 in the rankings, and I thought if Illinois won Wisconsin and won Iowa, they'd be ranked, and, we, and we're now 24. You had an outside shot of, of game day coming to Champaign with two ranked teams, and they've never been here. That probably pushes forward to Illinois would have to win all the way until November and Purdue would have to all win all the way until November to have two ranked teams maybe playing for the Big Ten West there. But these are the opportunities that are here. Game day probably goes away once uh, this whole ESPN is out of the Big Ten in a few years. Mm -hmm. They may go to some sites where Fox is broadcasting the game or whatever, but it just feels like ESPN is really going to drift toward the SEC and the ACC. So. Um, so, yeah, there, there's just these opportunities. Can you get to Indy? Can you get game day in Champaign? Can you get a 10-win season? All of that is in front of Illinois right now. And I want to ask you about the attendance as well. I, we had talked about after the Wisconsin game, probably going to be a pretty good showing. It's, mm -hmm. it's the highest attended game, uh, officially attended game, uh, mm -hmm. since North Carolina. Uh, now an even bigger chance uh, next week yes. against Minnesota as well. Yep. I think maybe 50K? Um, here's what I have – Settled on with attendance. Okay. I, I don't care as much about the overall number as I do. 
what last night was, was the people who have season tickets and come to two of the six games, three of the six games, all of those people were there last night because they have the tickets and they want to be there. So if you probably noticed it when you saw the crowd, just how packed the West Balcony, West Main, even some of the Horseshoe and East Main were. Sure, the East Balconies is looked like it has looked. You know, there were more people up there, but it obviously isn't full. Underneath the East Balcony, obviously, you know, you can see some voided out seats there. But overall, this was that game where everybody who has tickets or access to tickets says, I have to be there. It was as packed as I've seen the tailgating lots even more than, like, I guess it was in Grange Grove for North Carolina, so I didn't really walk around. But, like, that was as packed as tailgating has been in a long, long time that I have seen. And then just the, the noise. I mean, there was a false start penalty because the crowd was too loud, and <laughs> Iowa had got a false start because they couldn't hear the snap count. That doesn't happen. I swear to you that hasn't happened in, like, seven, eight years in Champaign. So it that is the part that warms my heart as a fan, that everybody who – has been dedicated to this program are still there and they're in the stands and they're in their seats and they were loud last night uh, and I'm sure the team can feel the energy. I want to say before we end here, I love the fit too. Yes. I, I appreciate you coming in the orange. You like that? Yeah. W tell me what the shoes are again. Tell the people. Uh, my son tells me they're LeBron 12s, but I don't even know what telling someone I'm wearing LeBron 12 says. But this isn't going to be on TV, right? Like no. this is We're just talking. No, we're just exactly. standing. In the, yeah. Exactly. So it's fine. Nobody no. will care that I'm wearing this. No, of course not. Yes. All right, Robert. Exciting times for Illinois football. Thanks so much for coming in once again. And uh, we'll keep this up. We'll talk after Minnesota, I think. Hopefully another win and maybe bowl eligibility to talk about. That would be incredible. It would blow my mind one more time. All right. Thanks, Robert. Thanks.